This morning, I want to ask you the question, are you really, are you really ready for death? Death is something that people don't want to talk about. And Allah's my witness, there is not one day that goes by that I don't think about death. Not a day. I think about death every day. And in fact, I want you, as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, for us to always constantly think about that reminder, that reminder of death. You may ask the question, why? Let's first deal with facts. Every two seconds, think about it. Nine babies are born in this earth and three people die. In one year, on an average, 50 million people will die. I look around and this audience is relatively young. How many of you are 20 years or older? Raise your hand. Raise them up. Was your hand raised? I didn't know, you know, whether he reached 20. You might be surprised to learn that from your birth, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, if 20, from the time that you were born, over 1 billion people have died. That means that every day you live, you're that closer to the grave. And the thing that's incumbent upon us to understand is that we have no guarantees. The question is, are you prepared for death? And I'm going to give you a test this morning to see if you're really prepared. I went to South Africa. And that country is relatively a very poor country. The gross national product of South Africa is $171 billion. I want to make sure you're listening to me. I said the gross national product of South Africa is what? $171 billion is the gross national product of South Africa. This country, America, have many sports. And the pastime of America's baseball, two years ago, 70 million Americans visited baseball parks. I said, how many? 70 million Americans visited baseball parks. Baseball, Americans pastime. In the same year that 70 million Americans visited baseball parks, are you ready? 93 million Americans visited casinos. I said the gross national product of South Africa is how much? $171 billion. Can I tell you how much Americans spent on gambling in one year? Over $400 billion. $400 billion dollars Americans have spent gambling. That means that America is a country of gamblers. I was in Great, I said, I started to say Great Britain again, didn't I? England or Britain. And they have in Britain now a lotto fever, the lottery. You know lottery? We're looking at the newspaper and on the front page, a Muslim won the big lottery in England. The reason that I mention that, brothers and sisters, is because Allah in the Quran mentions about gambling. Yes, they ask you about intoxicants and gambling. Why do I mention gambling and what does gambling have to do with death? My message this morning is this. I don't care if you are seven, eight, nine years old, or 20 years old, 
19 years old, I'm sorry. Or 100 years old. Don't gamble. I want you to consider this ayat from the Quran. Ya ayu alladhina aminu taqu Allah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutuna illa wa antum muslimun. O oh, you who believe, fear Allah as he should be feared and do not die except as a Muslim. Let me tell you the problem that you have as young people. The problem that you have as young people is that you feel in, uh, you feel, um, uh, what's that word? Invincible. You feel that you're going to be here a long time. But I can tell you brothers and sisters, don't gamble. A lot of you think like this. I'm young, I'm 19, I'm 20, I'm 21. Inshallah, I, I can have my fun now. I, a lot of time, I have a lot of time. I get older, I can start making my prayer. I can wear my hijab. I can I start going to the masjid. I can start reading the Quran. I have plenty of time. And, and let me have my fun now. Imam Siraj, after all, you were young. You had your fun. Why can't we have our fun? Because you can't gamble. Last year, you know by now, most of you, that the most precious thing to me, my flower, my daughter, Basma Wahaj, died at the young age of just short of her 20th birthday. She had been married one year, and she had given birth a week before. Healthy all of her life. And then Allah the Almighty decreed that she should go. Did it hurt me? Yes. The greatest gift to me, that daughter, a good Muslim. Many of you young sisters know her, or some of you know her, a good Muslim. But yet, I am reminded in the Quran, Glory be to him in whose hands is the dominions of the heavens and the earth. And he, Allah, created death and life to test you who's best in conduct. So the purpose of life is to be tested by Allah and death to be tested by Allah. You, if you live long enough, will lose a loved one. Your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfather, your uncle, your husband, your wife, your children, all of you will be tested by death. After all, 50 million people a year. It's inevitable. So the real question is not to get angry, or the real point is not to get angry at Allah because Allah took your loved one. Recognize. No soul can die except by the permission of Allah. It's already written in a book. I have nothing to do with that. We try our best to live the best life that we can live. Eat good food. Stay away from the haram. But even if you eat the most healthy of food, you exercise and you, and you run and you jog and you do all of that. Yet, there's no guarantee that your life would be extended. We're here but by grace of Allah. And I want to thank Allah for every day that he's given to me. If Allah gave you 20 years, thank him for that. Don't expect to get more than that. Don't expect to have another day. If you have the attitude that this is your last day, then the person who has the attitude and the knowledge that it's their last day is different from a person who believes they'll be here for a long time. Make plans as if you will be here forever. Make plans to go to college. Make plans to study your career. My daughter was studying to become a doctor. She just was short of a graduation, in fact, her mother and myself was invited to the graduation and they gave her a degree. But all of those years are not wasted. Not as a Muslim. Because everything you do for the pleasure of Allah, you get reward for Allah. And if in the back of your mind you want to be a doctor for the Muslims, to aid the Muslims, or to be a lawyer to help the Muslims, good, plan it. 
But if Allah takes your life or take the life of someone that you love, be careful that you don't say anything at the displeasure of Allah the Almighty. So brothers and sisters, my first message, don't gamble. There's no guarantee that any of us will get back home from this conference and this convention. Don't gamble. Number two, if you make a mistake, which you will make a mistake, you will commit sin. There's none perfect. But if you make a mistake and if you commit a sin, then ask Allah's forgiveness immediately and follow up a bad deed with a good deed, it will wipe it out. Number three, the real question is, how prepared are you for death? If it came tomorrow, someone asked the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, Meta Sa'a, when is the hour of judgment? And the Prophet could have answered, Only Allah knows. Allahu Alam. And that would be the right answer. But the Prophet chose in this instance to answer another way. He said, Ma'adatta laha. What did you prepare for it? Are you prepared for death? Why is death important? Because death is that defining moment when something happens. إِذَا مَاتَ الْإِنسَانُ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَمَالُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ Said the Messenger of Allah, because when a person dies, his works is cut off. The beautiful thing about you I looked at this convention, this conference, this convention, and do you know that while we at the Regency Hotel, the other people there, did you see them? Do you know why they're there? I asked them. I've been speaking to them. Yes, I talked to them. Because I'm a da'i. I'm a what? I'm a da'i. I believe in giving da'wah to invite people to Islam. So while we're looking at the Muslims in this conference, I'm also looking at the non-Muslims. It's a family reunion. This is one big Richardson family. But look at the difference. I watch you in the morning, and I learned this from the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to start watching people. Next time you go to the airport today or tomorrow, how many of you are flying back home? I want you to do this, inshallah, right? I want you to go to the airport, and I want you to sit there. I want you to go early. Don't go late. And I want you to sit there, and I want you to watch the people. Watch their eyes. And tell me if you can tell all the people who are late for their flight. You watch the people late for the flight. Look at their eyes. And they're walking, and they're running. And you can see, right? Because you know is this sense of urgency. They're late and they're trying to get the flight and they're going like this and all the signs are there. And you know, subhanAllah, I was watching the Muslims, Fajr, and you see them coming out of their rooms, coming everywhere. No matter what we're doing, we don't forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't that something? No matter what we're doing, and everything we do is defined by Allah, even our entertainment. We have some young brothers here who are tennis players. Where are they? Two great tennis players. Where are they? I know they were here. You know what I like to see? These brothers, where are they? May become great tennis players one day. They're very good right now, by the way. You're going to hear about them, inshallah. But know what I want to see? And I didn't tell them this. I want to see them ranked one and two in the world. And I want to see them go to Wim Wilmington, Wilmington, right? And guess what? I want a new uniform. <laughs> yeah. I want a new uniform that says I'm a Muslim. I play tennis, I play basketball, but I'm a Muslim. And wouldn't that be something? And because that would be so much da'wah. Rank number one in the world and have long pants on. SubhanAllah. Are you prepared for death? 
How many of you have moved from your house or home in the last five years? Raise your hand. Uh, look, look around. Look at this. How many intend to move in the future? How many intend to buy a house? Isn't that something? You plan to buy a house, this is good. But guess what? What about that house that all of us will live in, in the neighborhood called the graveyard? How many thought about that house? Since you will die, I don't mean for you to raise your hand. <laughs> Since you will die, and it is inevitable that you'll die, and no one has escaped death, and since the last 20 years, one billion people have died, and since 50 million people die a year, and since three people die every two seconds, then why not prepare for the next home before the hereafter, and that is the grave. The blessing that you have right now in my conclusion is that every one of you, I don't care whatever the level of your practice, the great gift that you have right now is the gift of life and a chance and a hope. Because brothers and sisters, when that moment comes, the moment of death, we cannot delay it. And we would wish every one of us to get more time to do what? To do more work. And we will be so happy. And we will remember every morning we got up to make Fajr prayer. Every day we fasted for Allah. We will remember that. Everything that we did for Allah. Every time we stayed away from the haram. When you were tested, young brothers, in school. And you were in school and you were tested by drugs and tested by women. As Prophet Yusuf was tested by a woman. And every time you stayed away from it, you refrained from it. You will be happy because you get a reward and a blessing from Allah. Don't gamble and think about the hereafter. I close with this. And so the Prophet asked the question, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did you prepare for death? Soon, soon, someone will be carrying you. Look at you this morning, you got up, you washed yourself. You took for granted, you took a bath, you had a shower. You took that for granted. Soon, you won't be able to wash your own self. Somebody, some Muslim has to wash your body and carry your body. I ask you, how many people do you think will attend your janazah? It's an important question. Two people, five people, a hundred people? Because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that anyone who a hundred people attend their janazah praying for the intercession, asking for Allah's forgiveness, Allah will accept their intercession. How many people would attend your janazah, your funeral? Are you prepared for death? How to be prepared for death? Only one way. Don't gamble. Live the best life you can live. Because think about it, your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your friends, they, if they're good Muslims, will go to the grave with you. And then they will leave you there. And I don't care how much your mother and father loved you, or your children loved you, or your friends loved you, or your imam loved you. They will leave you down there in that grave and they will walk away and you will hear their footsteps as they walk away. And you'll be in there by yourself. Are you prepared for that? Well, the best way to be prepared for that, for death, is to live life the best way you can. You young brothers and sisters, let me say this as I sit down and bring forth our great brother, Ahmed Al-Qadi. You may not know, realize this, but the people of America right now are waiting for you. They are. If justice is to come to this country, 
and in the world, it will have to come from you. You, the future of Islam. Hey, if Allah spares your life and you're around for another 20 years, there's 20 more years of good that you can be doing. 20 more years of service to Allah, the Almighty. But brothers and sisters, be happy to know, alhamdulillah, that you are servants of Allah and try to live every day from prayer to prayer. And remember the word of Aisha radiallahu anha about her husband, the messenger of Allah sallallahu Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yathkurullah ala kuli ahyani. And the messenger of Allah remembered Allah in every circumstances. May Allah bless you. I make dua and I pray Allah accept my dua that everyone here inshallah will make it to Jannah. And wouldn't it be good after the resurrection we're sitting around and talking about the, the Isna Convention of 1996. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? All of us there said, remember, we were in the hotel and we were talking and we had a great time. And even if some of us or all of us have to spend even a little time in the hellfire, I don't want to spend no time there. But even if we did, I'm so happy I'm so full of hope that I remember the words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that Prophet Musa asked Allah who will be the least person in the paradise. I mean the least. And Allah informed Prophet Musa Alayhi Salatu Wasallam that the least person in paradise will be a person who was in hellfire, who was burnt in hellfire so much that he became totally black by the fire and Allah would put him in the river of life and then Allah will say to that man go and enter paradise and the man will say oh Allah he's filled up everybody took their place there's no place for me and Allah will say go into paradise here's a man who was in hell and he will be the least and the last person to go to paradise. Allah will say, go enter into it. And the man said, oh Allah, please don't mock me. You're the Lord of the worlds. Please don't mock me. There's no room for me. And then Allah will say, go enter. And the man will enter. And Allah will ask him, would you like to have a kingdom like the great kingdoms of the people? or the kings of the world he said yes and Allah will say you shall have that and it's like and it's like and it's like and it's like and ten times more and this person will be the least in heaven and Allah will ask him and tell him you shall have everything that you desire and whatever you ask for you shall have and this shall be the least in paradise Allah is great. You can't earn Jannah. You can't earn paradise to live forever. You complain that Allah only gave you 20 years or only gave your child five years or only gave your mother uh, 60 years. You complain, shut up. What is 60 years? What is 100 years? What is 150 years compared with infamy in paradise of the greatness of paradise and all the joys and the pleasure of paradise? Imagine being in paradise with your grandmother that died years ago, or your grandfather, or your mother, or your daughter, or your son, or your husband, or your wife. Imagine being in paradise together forever. No more death. Ah, I want to get there. But the only way to get there, you got to be prepared. And if you're going to be prepared, you can't gamble. Don't gamble. And when you go back to home in Oklahoma, and go back to Detroit, and go back to Atlanta, Georgia, and go back to St. Louis, and go back to New York, when you go back to Canada, say, I'm going to leave Isna Conference, and I will be better than I ever been before. Yes, all the bad that I used to do, I'm going to make tauba. I'm going to ask Allah to forgive me. Because with Allah, timing is everything. Who can tell at that moment when you ask Allah's forgiveness, 
Allah's mercy, his doors of paradise will be open and he closed the hellfire for you. And that is my prayer, inshallah. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum. Brother and sisters, just because of the time restraints, I'm going to just try to answer just a couple. Number one, um, can you please elaborate on the fear of Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala and how can you balance the fear and the hope? And um, there are two different things and I always tend to veer more to the one side than the other, that is the fear. I think it's an excellent question. Um, both of them is given in the Quran, both fear and hope and in hadith. I want to try to give you one hadith that I think sums up the attitude that we should have. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that La ya'lamul kafirin, if the disbelievers knew the extent of Allah's punishment, I'm sorry, of Allah's mercy, rahmatah, rahmatihi, of Allah's mercy, none of them would uh, uh, have the idea that they would go to hell. If the disbelievers knew, لَيَعْلِمُ الْكَافِرِ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ رَحْمَتِهِ If the disbelievers understood the extent of Allah's mercy, all of them would think they go to Jannah. That means they don't know the extent of His mercy. This is shown in many hadith. One hadith, just, I mentioned one yesterday about the man who murdered a hundred people. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave that man, murdered a hundred people. The other, other famous hadith is a woman, a prostitute, that gave water to a thirsty dog. And because of that, Allah gave a paradise. There's a man in paradise, the prophet said, who's there only because he cut down a tree that was in the way that inconvenienced the people. So when you study hadith, the more we learn and the more we study, little things apparently Allah gives them big blessings for. A woman who gave a half a date to her children, one half a date to one girl and another half to another girl, and because of that, Allah forgave her her sins. So you see many, many instances where Allah's mercy, not His justice, his mercy, uh, and then as a result of that, people go to Jannah by his, his mercy. On the other hand, had the Prophet said in the other part of the hadith, لا يعلم المؤمنون ما عند الله من أقوبتي. If the Muslims and believers knew the extent of Allah's punishment, none of them would think that they would go to paradise. They would all think they go to hell. Then you can think, I think Shaykh Jamal Badr, we mentioned the other day of a woman who's in hellfire only because she had a cat. She wouldn't feed it. She locked it up, she tied it up, wouldn't let it go out on its own, and the cat died. And because of that, Allah punished the woman in hellfire. How she treated the cat. One woman, a prostitute, right, gave water, not to a prophet, not to a Muslim, not even to a human being, but gave water to a dog, and went to Jannah, paradise, and a woman locked up a cat and didn't feed it and went to hell. There's a man in hellfire who would be there because the prophet said a coat that he stole from someone. Another person in hellfire because of committing zina, fornication and adultery. Another person in hellfire because they didn't pay zakat. So when you start studying ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may punish us in the hellfire, in ways where Allah may give us the mercy, we have the balance and we think of both, both of them. Some people are motivated only by good things. If your parent tells the child, listen, if you do this, I give you an allowance, I give you money, I let you do some good things. And they're motivated by that. Others, they're motivated by fear. Some, some of my children, you know, I had nine children. Some of them I say, listen, you know, I'm telling you, don't do that. I'm going to take care of you. And they know what I mean by take care of you. <laughs> and some of them, they don't believe me. I have, to, I have to give them a spanking. Somebody once said, if you don't get the message in the, in the mind, you must get it in the behind. You said it. <laughs> so the balance. The other question is, is a very good question. Um, a sister asks, I guess it's a thick question. Um, she says, um, can a woman go to the graveyard if her loved one dies to bury them? Why or why not? And um, here in America, people, that is women, go to the burial ceremony. Uh, is it right or wrong? Please guide us. It is not haram for a woman to go to the cemetery. According to, there's a several hadith, and Sheikh Jamal Badi was just with him. I saw him here somewhere. He's, he's around somewhere. And that's the person you need to ask these kind of fit questions to. But I heard someone, uh, he asked, someone asked this question. 
and he reminded of, of a number of things. One hadith, by the way, one of the Sahaba, I, I don't remember the name, she said that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, kind of, you know, recommended that the women don't go, not strongly prohibited it. And this is because of the general emotion and the tenderness of the heart of the women, and they cry so much sometimes in, of their beloved ones, so he recommended for them, if they're going to be like that, that they shouldn't go. Not that it's haram. In the other case, a uh, very interesting case, uh, where the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, passed a woman in a graveyard, and she was crying over a loved one that died, and the Prophet said, be patient. And he didn't say, astaghfirullah, sister, you should leave this place because it's haram for you to be here. But he just told her to be patient. So it's not a strong prohibition, but the sisters should know themselves, and if they feel they can't control themselves, then perhaps they shouldn't go. I don't have time for any other questions. Maybe I'll just do one more, and then I want to do a request that someone gave me. Someone asked a question about significance of salat. And I just want to say this, uh, brothers and sisters, don't just be satisfied with just making your salat, and, you know, um, but try when you make your prayer to feel something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try not to be thinking about other things. And I just want to mention, mention this one hadith. Uh, and the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, was very observant. And he was watching a person, he was sitting in the masjid with some sahaba. And a Muslim came in and made salat and came to the Prophet and said, Assalamu alaikum. The Prophet said, Wa alaikum salam, farajit fa salli, fa inna kalam tu salli. Go back and pray because you have not prayed. You see, the Prophet is very observant. So he's watching the man, so the man went back and prayed again. And when he finished, he came to the Prophet and said, Assalamu alaikum, ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet said, Wa alaikum salam, farajit fa salli, fa inna kalam tu salli. Go back and pray for you have not prayed. This happened three times. And the man said, O Messenger of Allah, teach me to pray. I know no prayer better than this. And so the Prophet taught him to pray. And the thing that the man was doing wrong is that he was rushing through his prayer not taking the time to really think and focus about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So please, try to focus on your salat. One of the ways to help you focus on your salat, believe it or not, is the more surahs that you learn and understand what you're saying, why you're saying them, that will help you to focus. Ya ayyuladhina aminu taqul, la taqurbu salat wa antum sukara hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun. Oh, you who believe, uh, do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated until you understand what you're saying. So many of us are not intox intoxicated, but yet we don't understand what we're saying. So when we memorize Quran, for some of us is like what someone would call, if you don't understand the words you're using, nonsensical words. It's not nonsensical at all. No, it's the words of Allah. Even if you didn't understand them, there's blessings, but better if you understood what you were reciting in the Quran and focus on the words that you're saying in the Salat. So, um, in my opinion, I found that learning the ayats of the Quran and what they mean help us to focus, inshallah. And this is the last thing. Uh, my uncle died this summer at the age of 26. He drowned saving his younger brother. In such a big gathering, can you please uh, make dua for him that he gets paradise and that our family gets sabr or patience? Please make a dua for him. His name is Muhammad Abdul Wahid. And I say this uh, for that sister, that I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we ask together that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive this brother, Muhammad Abdul Wahid, forgive him his sins and enter them to Jannah. And what a great thing to risk your life for another one. And this is really a good example for us. This is a direct hadith on that. You're not a true believer until you love for your brother. This is literally his brother, what you love for yourself. And he loved his brother more than his own life, that he risked his life for his own brother. Don't forget brother Muhammad Abdul Wahid in your dua collectively and individually.